Okay, we're back. We're live for the two o'clock block. This is Jay Fidel and Think Tech. It's the military in Hawaii, which we do every other Thursday. And we have two generals with us and the BGEN on the screen stands for Brigadier General. Okay, we have um, on, on the one side, Brigadier General Joseph Harris with the Air National Guard, Hawaii Air National Guard. Um, and on the other side, we have the Army. Uh, we have Brigadier General Moses Kawivi, and he's with the Army uh, National Guard here in Hawaii. Uh, so welcome to the show, you guys. It's so nice to see you here. Thank you for coming down. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jay, for uh, allowing us to be on today. Yeah, I told you my first question is going to be, and uh, let's talk to you first, Moses. Uh, how do I get your job? I want your job. I like your job. <laughs> I, I, I like <laughs> what you do. <laughs> I like the whole thing. So how do I get your job? Well, there's many avenues to get to where I'm at, uh, but it, it took me um, a long time to get to where I'm at uh, as far as uh, the Hawaii National Guard, Hawaii Army National Guard commander. But I actually joined the Guard when uh, I was 17, straight out of high school. I uh, joined as an enlisted soldier. And uh, after four years, I decided to, uh, uh, that I wanted to go through officer candidate school, became an officer, and uh, got my qualifications in education and made my way through the ranks in, in a nutshell, I should say. And then uh, here I am today as the yeah. Army National Guard commander. So uh, that is something because you're the, you're the senior man. You're the guy in charge of the Army National Guard in the state of Hawaii. How big is it? How many, how is it divided up? Uh, where, where are the units located? Can you talk about that? Well, we're um, a fairly, what we call a small size state, but uh, we have uh, approximately uh, around 2,500 personnel, give or take, depending on the recruiting um, fluctuation or retirements uh, in the Hawaii Army National Guard. And uh, we, we're across the state in all counties. So from Hilo all the way to uh, uh, Hanapepe and Kauai, we have units uh, across uh, the state and in Maui, as well as um, the bulk of units are here on Oahu. You know, I really uh, I hadn't thought of it, but uh, you must be, with all that geography, you must be affected by COVID. Can you take a minute and tell me how COVID has affected your operation in, in this command? Yeah, interestingly, COVID um, has actually created a, um, a challenges for us to train, um, but uh, not impossible. Uh, we've, um, uh, the basis on the army um, for the Army training is really the squad. And the squad level is, is approximately six, six people, maybe up to 10 people, depending on the type of unit you have. So with that, and that is the foundation of uh, our Army units from the squad level all the way up, you can actually uh, do some training uh, with that amount of people separated from the breast and, and maintain that uh, the COVID-19 um, mitigation standards uh, that is out there. Also, uh, we have uh, the ability today with the technology to complete our uh, primary military education or with uh, distance learning or uh, online type of training uh, to, to ensure that we, we get qualified in uh, the rank that we're in, as well as uh, any other type of, uh, type of training that we need that doesn't require us to go into the field, uh, classroom type of training or updates or any type of um, other types of um, uh, additional type of training or good to have training. Well, this is an opportunity in some ways then for, for training. Um, let's turn to you, uh, General Harris, uh, uh, Brigadier General Harris. I want to be clear that everybody understands the BGEN. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, how do I get your job? It's not that I'm looking for both of your jobs, but I'm, I'm making a comparison so I can decide which of your jobs I really want, okay? Uh, tell me how you got there and what I need to do to, to uh, replace you. All right. Uh, well, um, there's many paths to get to where I am. And uh, certainly I had no idea when I started that I'd end up in this in this position. And I'm, I'm sure Moses would tell you the same thing. Uh, the, the careers are a long, it's a long path. And so you never, you never know quite where it'll lead. But much like Moses, I started right out of high school. Uh, I started when I was 19 as a part-time citizen soldier going to college and, uh, and working in the summers and uh, had an opportunity to go full-time uh, enlisted. I, was, uh, I made it to the rank of E7 uh, after 13 years enlisted 
uh, and then had an opportunity to get commissioned. I got my school and training out of the way. Uh, I trained mostly in logistics, uh, Air Force logistics, which is uh, one of the larger, if not the largest career area in the Air Force, as you might imagine. Uh, flying missions uh, require a ton of logistics and support to uh, to operate. Uh, so that was uh, kind of my chosen profession. I uh, worked my way up in mostly in the Oregon Air National Guard and then moved to Hawaii about five or six years ago and uh, joined the maintenance effort here and uh, did that initially for about four years and then moved down to headquarters to learn plans and programs and some of the staff work that goes on at state headquarters. And then uh, just earlier this year, I had the opportunity to kind of lead up to the position I'm in now uh, at the commander uh, position of the Hawaii Air National Guard. So how big is your command? What's, what kind of facilities and um, equipment do you have? Yeah, that's a, so we've got about uh, almost 2,500 folks, about 2,498 is the, the complete population. We're on uh, the four major islands, uh, but like, uh, like the Army, the bulk of us are on Oahu. Um, the largest kind of segment of us is the 154th Wing on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, they've got all three of the flying missions, uh, as well as many of the support squadrons. And that's about 90% of the Hawaii Air National Guard uh, right there. Um, then we've got some GSUs. Uh, we've got com com combat communication squadrons on the Big Island and on Maui. Uh, and then now on Kauai, we've got our uh, nascent space control squadron that uh, that we were talking about before the show started. Mm. So uh, you, um, do you you must get around, uh, and when you get around, you must take you must take planes in the uh, Hawaii Air National Guard. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. You know, normally when we perform our monthly drills, uh, we we do what's called a GSU run, um, and that GSU stands for Geographically Separated Unit. And so what we do is we we utilize our own aircraft, and sometimes other states sign up for this mission, uh, where they help us pick up our guardsmen and then uh, drop them off after drill back uh, back on their islands. And so we've got some folks on Oahu that work on uh, the outer islands and then we've got some folks that live on the outer islands that work on Oahu and so we've got to get those people moved around uh, normally to, to drill. Um, now obviously with COVID uh, that that movement has been halted and so we've had to come up with uh, creative ways to keep those people in touch with their units, uh, continue their training. Uh, it's been challenging but uh, uh, we've come up with ways to work around it and, and maintain our readiness. Well, um, um, Moses, I, you know, I'm really interested in the difference between um, the air, rather the Army National Guard and the, and the regular Army. And I, I wonder how much exposure you and your, your, your troops have to the regular Army uh, when you interface with them, um, the uh, comparison of your systems, uh, your practices and their practices. I mean, what can you differentiate for me what it's like in the one and the other, uh, and um, uh, you know how it's different? Yeah, the, the only real difference is uh, the times that we get to uh, to train. So traditionally, the Army National Guard, like the Air National Guard, were um, one week in a month, two weeks out of the year at the base level. However, in the past uh, few years, actually in the past years since. Uh, 9/11, uh, that has increased. Uh, we've we've had uh, more opportunities to to come in and train, and uh, more um, activities such as deployments that we've been on. We cycle through the deployment like uh, regular army units do, uh, depending on where the need is that the the army needs. We are an operational reserve force for the army, and we have to. Um, maintain the same training standards and equipment standards and personnel standards that the Army has. So there's no different. Um, there's no difference between us and the Army when it comes to the requirements that must be done to maintain our readiness standards. One of the most important things that is required is, is our personal readiness, which is uh, like what we talked about a little bit earlier, which was our, our uh, education um, and uh, our uh, certifications and our training. So if, um, if you would put two units side by side, um, an active duty army unit and a 
National Guard units are in a deployment, and most of the time you're not going to tell what the, what the difference is between the two units um, as far as uh, executing the mission mm -hmm. uh, because of the standards that we both are uh, required to do. What are the priorities in the mission? I mean, if you could list a couple of them that are right up at the top, uh, you know, what do you see as the priorities for the uh, Army uh, National Guard? Uh, for for me, the priority for me is, is personnel readiness, and that goes down to individual uh, readiness, which means uh, you you have to have a, a good physical, uh, you have to be physically fit, you have to have um, all your military education requirements done and civilian education requirements, because the the army does have, uh, depending on what rank you are, certain education requirements, civilian education requirements that you have to maintain, and depending also on your military occupational skill. Uh, we have a wide variety of skills across uh, the spectrum uh, within the Army. Uh, and for the Hawaii Army National Guard, that ranges from medics to infantrymen to cavalrymen to doctors to nurses. Uh, we have staff planners, battle staff planners, um, a whole wide range of skills, intelligence officers, intelligence NCOs, um, logistics personnel, uh, and all those uh, skill sets bring together or come together to ensure that uh, we can function as a unit and be ready uh, when uh, the time is, comes to either uh, do our federal mission, uh, which is uh, to be deployed in support uh, of the, the active duty army, um, to support and defend the constitution of the United States. And then our state mission, which is the mission to um, do our operations in accordance with what the, the governor has and obey the orders of the governor. And that includes uh, doing missions such as uh, what we're doing now in response to uh, uh, COVID-19 mitigation for the state and supporting the state and counties. What, what are you doing now for COVID? Well, for COVID, uh, we established what we call a joint task force actually. And that is actually a combination between or among uh, both army and air assets. So army and air uh, National Guard personnel and forces. So uh, Brigadier General Harris has some of his personnel and uh, units and skills uh, within the joint task force that we've established. And I have some of the Army personnel and, and skills uh, across the state. And we're doing a lot of things such as uh, screening at the airports. Uh, we're, uh, we have a task force medical setup made of uh, Army uh, and air personnel who are uh, doing uh, assistance to the Department of Health in swabbing, um, and, and you've seen the news with contact tracing, or what we call COVID mapping, and, and other type of COVID-19 mitigation education. Well, that's directly for the benefit of the community then. Your mission, at least in part, is to be yes. right out there in the community and help the community. I was gonna ask you about that. Yes. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, re recruiting, or at least by implication. And uh, it seems to me there's a lot of people out of work right now, including skilled people, you know, who lost their jobs already. And I wonder if that, you know, how that impacts your ability to recruit uh, qualified people. I mean, do you, do you have the billets for them? Are you out there looking for them? I'm always if, looking for people and uh, come on down if you want to join the Hawaii Army National Guard. We're, we're ready with the sons and the daughters of Hawaii. Come on down to the recruiters. They'll set you up. They'll give you the the range of uh, military occupational skills that you might be interested in and take the ASVAB and we'll see where you sit or fit in the, um, in the gamut of skills and, and we'll get you in. Uh, right, right now, um, we really need personnel to help, especially in times like this uh, with COVID-19 uh, mitigation efforts. Um, the more people we have, in the Hawaii Army National Guard, the more people we can have out there helping the community. That's great. That is really great. That is really an important takeaway from this whole discussion. You mentioned a, a joint force uh, with you and General Harris, and I'm interested in that. It, it strikes me, and I'm not really familiar with how you know it works, but you have the, mm, I guess you would say, uh, the, the local commander in chief is the governor, and then you have the, the services, at least the, uh, the Army National Guard and the Air Force National Guard, and you guys get together and you create this this joint joint command or joint staff. Is that right? Does it work like a, yes. like a parallel to what happens in Washington? Well, it, it works uh, parallel to similar how, how you would set up a force to go 
and deploy for any type of contingency operation. So we set up a headquarters with the necessary command and control um, elements and staff to, to planning and monitor operations and execute operations. And that's the headquarters element. Then like for us here right now with COVID-19, we create also geographical or functional task forces. For example, a geographical task force would be a task force responsible for the area um, or, or land space and anything that happens in that area. Mm -hmm. So what well, we have four geographical task forces set up across the state to, to match the counties and each geographical task force commander is working with the county EOC uh, administrators and also the mayor to assist them in, in any type of gaps or skills or capability that they need that the National Guard might be able to assist with uh, concerning this COVID-19 mitigation. We also yeah. have specific functional task force like like a task force medical. So I have a task force just dedicated for medical type support that is assisting with the de Department of Health uh, in swabbing, COVID mapping, or contact tracing as, as it's known, and, and other areas in planning and other operations. What about uh, deployment, General? Uh, you know, I remember, gee, I, I'm sorry, I can't put my finger on exactly when, but there was a time when the uh, Hawaii National Guard was, uh, was uh, activated and it was sent overseas. I don't remember exactly when that was, but it was it was quite something where everybody was putting yes. his boots on and uh, taking off for, for parts unknown for war. Uh, how often does that happen? Uh, well, actually, you know, we, we've been um, doing deployment since uh, 2004, as early as, as 2004, with um, actually 2003, when you're looking at our aviation units, and then in 2004, with the uh, mobilized the 29th Brigade in its first mobilization since 1968. And we've continuously actually uh, mobilized units on what we call a um, sustainable readiness model that the Army has. Every so many years, we cycle in um, units into uh, to support the Army on a deployment. Um, our um, 29th Brigade actually had several units that were deployed across um, Europe as well as in Egypt uh, last last year mm -hmm. uh, for a Kosovo mission as well as to assist in the uh, multinational peacekeeping in the multinational forces observers in in uh, the Sinai. You get to so go every so them? many years we'll cycle through a deployment um, or come up on a deployment then and, and it depends on the need. Uh, it's not the same type of deployment. Our aviation units always deploy every so many years to into uh, to support the regular army as well. So it's, it's, it's become a routine event versus a one-time event and then a, and a large gap. You get to uh, go with them? Excuse me? You get to go with them? Yeah, I, I deployed twice. I uh, deployed once in uh, 2004 to the 2005 and deployment in, and we got out of Iraq in 2006. And then I went back into Kuwait as the uh, Camp Virginia commander uh, back in 2000. Um, Eight in October through 2009 and got back in uh, Hawaii about August 2009. So that's my two main deployments. So uh, General Harris, uh, you get to see uh, uh, General Kaovi, uh, Kaovi uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, meet on the joint, the joint command there. Uh, how well, I mean, how often? Well, uh, I would say probably once a month or so. Uh, my uh, I, I'm I'm a part-time uh, citizen soldier. I think he's he's full-time. Uh, so, it, but we both work out of the same facility down at Fort Ruger uh, there on Diamond Head Road. Uh, so, which is where the TAGS offices are as well. So, we do run into each other, and uh, we certainly are on a lot of telephone calls together with the TAG. Um, you know, working together uh, to 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 do. Uh, everything that the, the governor and the TAG requires of us. But so uh, your mission would be a little different than what General Kuwait was saying. Uh, I wonder if you could differentiate that for me. It, it's not going to be the same and your deployments aren't going to be the same, are they? No, they're not. Um, so, I mean, starting, starting back with kind of the differences between the, the Army, or I'm sorry, the Air, uh, Air Force, the regular Air Force and the, um, the Air National Guard. Mission-wise, it's very similar to the Army, where capability-wise, readiness-wise, we have all the same parallel requirements, uh, and that's for good reason, so we can be embedded right with them and, and be transparent uh, in terms of getting the job done. 
Um, and, and, and we're both set up that way. Um, the, the National Guard is set up that way constitutionally. Um, and, and so day to day, we are embedded with our active duty Air Force counterparts at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, where the bulk of the Hawaii Air National Guard resides. Um, and so we, we're right here with PACAF headquarters uh, on the Joint Base. And we're also in what's called a total force association uh, with two of our flying missions. And that's the C-17 and the F-22 Raptor, um, where active duty and guard forces uh, combine under one set of uh, command and control structure to get the mission done uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so are you, so we, are yeah. you flying around the Pacific with these aircraft? I mean, how far do you go? What's your area of operation? Well, each platform is designed for something different. Um, the C-17s are in the global, what we call the global en route system, uh, along with all the other C-17s uh, across the globe. And, and they are uh, all, over the, all over the world at any given time. Um, the tankers uh, are, are similar. Uh, they do a lot of local support for flying with our, with our fighter units. Uh, they do a, a lot of local uh, support here in the Pacific and around the Hawaiian Islands, uh, providing uh, tanker refueling to uh, support to, to all those air operations that are in the proximity. But they also sign up for missions all over the globe as well. Um, so they're very mobile, constantly deployed. Um, and there, there's a continuous, uh, we were also part of the Guam uh, task force over there that, that the tankers uh, are involved with. And so we've always got a constant level of participation going on over there in Guam. So between uh, the, uh, the Army and the, uh, the Air Guard, you guys get around. The Army gets around, obviously, in the Middle East, gets deployed there, and you're flying everywhere. And I wonder if the, uh, the uh, Army uh, National Guard and the Air, uh, the Air National Guard in, in the state of Nebraska does the same thing. Um, I kind of doubt it. Uh, you know, Hawaii has to be unique because of its location, because of its proximity to other military bases and so forth. Uh, am I right about that? Is it different between Hawaii as a, as a base for these operations and other states on the mainland? Yeah, the, the Hawaii Air National Guard is quite unique. It's got the largest wing in the Air National Guard and, it, and having the, the combination of flying missions that it has is also very unique. There's not a parallel, uh, not very many parallel units like it. Uh, and it's for the reasons you described, because our geography and our strategic, uh, the, the strategic uh, nature of our location in the middle of the Pacific, um, it, it, it requires that kind, of, that kind of makeup of our missions. Um, so as you said, yes, we, we are all over the place. Um, you know, one, one mission I didn't mention flying is the, is the F-22 Raptor. Uh, now, obviously they stay, they're a fighter, so they don't travel across the water uh, as regularly, except for depot maintenance and and uh, when they need to deploy uh, to a mission to the Middle East or to, uh, to Asia or wherever they're tasked to go. Um, but whenever they do that, they require tanker support, they require airlift support with the C-17s. Uh, and so that combination of air missions that we have gives us a ton of capability to move around the Pacific with a variety of combat power. And that's uh, before we even get to Barking Sands. Can you take a minute and tell me what you've got going in space and in Barking Sands? Yeah, we're really excited about the direction we're growing right now, and that that is in the, in 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 space, and uh, obviously the creation of Space Force, and uh, a lot of the effort that the Department of Defense is putting into space uh, is something that a lot of uh, guard units are are excited about and trying to get involved in, and we're lucky enough, uh, again by virtue of our location here in Hawaii, uh, to be considered for one of these missions. Uh, so we've got a brand new uh, space control squadron, what we call an offensive space control squadron that we're establishing at uh, PMRF on, on Kauai. And um, it, it's, uh, it's about 90 folks total. Once we get everybody hired, we've got about 22 out of those, uh, out of those uh, 88 folks hired. And we are also waiting on some environmental assessment uh, stuff to get completed before we can start provisioning the unit out there. Uh, the facilities are already there from units that have been there in the past, uh, but we've got to get them configured for the space control mission, and we've got to get the training um, equipment out there so that the folks that we are getting can start to train and, and be ready to deploy here in a couple of years.
So how can I get recruited? Where do I go? Is there a website, a place, a, a telephone number? Um, how do I, how do I, uh, you know, uh, uh, get that job? Well, we, uh, much like the Army, we are, um, you know, in COVID-19, to answer your question earlier, it, it definitely affects uh, our ability to recruit and retain folks. Uh, and we're, um, you know, that, that's maybe the, the silver lining. And whenever the, the economy takes a downturn, it's a little easier to recruit and retain folks to the, uh, to the, to the Guard, the Army and the Air National Guard. Um, and, and we're glad to be able to provide great opportunity for those that are struggling to find uh, good employment, um, you know, on our side too. And, and uh, we have great opportunity in all of our mission sets to, to, uh, to employ folks in, in it. And that's, that's, you asked about the differences between active and guard. One of the big differences is when you join the guard, you, you get to choose kind of your level of participation. You can do as little as the base, which is that one weekend a month or 15 days a year, or you can sign up for additional periods of full-time duty, active duty, and a variety of statuses. And that get paid more. Merit. That's right. And, and you, can, you, can get, you can learn your job faster if you go that way, and you can earn more money as needed. So depending on what your needs are for your family, uh, whether you've whether you got a part-time job somewhere else, a school, family, uh, you can arrange your guard membership into your life how you see fit and uh, provide a great service for your state, your country, uh, and yourself. Uh, well, I want so to turn to uh, General Coeva for a minute because we're almost out of time. And <laughs> I mentioned before that we, we, we need to talk about the role of the Guard, both uh, the Army and the Air Guard um, in, in today's political environment. I mean, there are issues where the Guard has been either called, uh, activated by, I guess, either the governors or, the, or, or Washington um, to participate in dealing with uh, uh, potential or actual street violence. Uh, there are legal issues attached to that. There have been many discussions about you know, what the guard would do if it was ordered to perform acts that are considered illegal and where the guard would get advice uh, on the legality of a given order coming from the administration. Uh, I'm sure you've thought about that uh, and I hope you never have to face it, <laughs> but I wonder what your thoughts are uh, in terms of a time when the guard is actually a a a a, a part of the political environment, actually. Well, for us in Hawaii, the Hawaii National Guard, we pretty much uh, work for the governor of the state of Hawaii on a Title Thirty Two um, basis. That's where our authorities lie, and so the governor is really our commander in chief. So, as um, despite what the politics is out there, we we are here to. Defend the state, the Constitution, and the Constitution of the United States. Should there be any um, question as to whether there is a legal issue with the use of the guard, uh, we, we leave that up to the lawyers to figure out, as well as our own judge advocate generals, as well as those in in D.C. National Guard Bureau up in D.C. Also, um, is that uh, entity that can uh, vet some of that the questions for us? And then, of course, we have the state attorney general here in Hawaii that um, pretty much gives us advice as from a state level on what uh, we should be doing or not be doing um, in accordance with uh, what the need is out there. Uh, General Harris, would you have anything to uh, add or comment on that issue? Uh, I, I would just say that uh, um, we are, you know, we're constantly involved in the political environment and uh, we are always available for our governor uh, to be used for domestic response, you know, whether it's with hurricane response, whether it's with the lava flow. Um, we, we, we have a routine of, of developing the task force similar to the one that, that uh, General Kawidi already described uh, for all those kinds of domestic response uh, events. Uh, that, is, that is how we're founded constitutionally and we're proud to do it, uh, you know, to be living in communities where we also serve uh, serve our governor like the like General Kawibi described. Uh, it's it's who we are. It's it's who we are as a you know as founded by the Constitution, and we're like I said, we're very proud to do it. Yeah, and um, that's consistent with everything I've ever seen about the Hawaii uh, Guard and National Guard. So we're about to close here. Uh, General Harris, can you go first and and say what you want to leave with people about the quality and um, you know role of the Air National Guard in Hawaii and where you see it going in terms of. Uh, being part of the development of the state? 
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we, we're very excited about the future that we've got ahead of us. We're, we're developing in space, uh, as I already talked about. We're also excited to, to continue to develop our uh, cyberspace type capabilities. Uh, our, our flying platforms, we're continuing to modernize them and keep them relevant uh, to, to the threat environment that's out there. Um, we're also really proud of, of what, who we are in Hawaii. Uh, we're on all the islands, uh, just like the Army, and we're, um, we're excited to work with the communities and local leaders uh, to partner and align interests wherever we can and, um, and be there for our state and for our governor, and yet also con continuously train for our federal mission, uh, our Title X mission as well. Uh, so I think we've got a really exciting outlook for the future. Uh, we'd love to have you join us and be a part of us. And... Um, yeah, I, th I think I'll, I think that's, uh, that's how I'll conclude. Okay, you, you take an older gentleman like myself in the guard. We'll find a way, Jay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> General Kaoibi, can you answer the same question? Where do you see it all going? What's the role, you know, of the guard now uh, in these special times and going forward? How do you see it evolving as a, as a, as an element of state? I, I want to say state government, but the, the, the whole state, where does it fit and where will it fit? Well, I think um, for us in the Hawaii Army National Guard, as well as the Air Guard, I would say, um, really our role is, is going to continue to to assist and help the um, the community. Um, uh, we we were like what General uh, Harris stated. We we were founded on, on such principles. Uh, we're community based. Uh, I like to say that we're the sons and we're the daughters of Hawaii. Where they help you in COVID-19. So, so message to all of you out there, continue to wear your masks, practice social distancing. <laughs> we're there to help you as well. Um, and, and we're gonna be there no matter no matter what. Well, we're gonna we're gonna count on you actually. I think we actually have no choice but to count on you in case of extreme weather, which is <laughs> yeah. coming with climate change. You know, any day could be, you know, a big storm. And uh, we're we'll be we'll 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 really appreciate your help in those times because you you are our primary protector in those times, I would say. Yeah. So so I've been I've been doing disaster management since um I would say 1992 Hurricane Iniki was my first major one as a young lieutenant, and uh, over the years I've continued to assist in various as as I grew up in the National Guard uh, in various disasters and, and and I continue to do so. So um, from my past experience, I expect the Hawaii National Guard to continue on into the future doing the same and helping the community. Thank you so much, uh, General Kawivi and General Harris. Great to have you on the show. Great to have this discussion. I think it's very helpful to the community to know more about you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Welcome. Really appreciate thanks. the opportunity to tell our story. Yeah, thanks Aloha. for having us. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.